for joining us for this evening's Dairy Co webinar. Uh, my name is Amy Fawcett, I'm Lead Extension Officer on the Dairy Co Mastitis Control Plan. Um, we've currently got 12 people logged in at the moment. We did have 48 registered, so hopefully there will be a few more in a little while. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Pete Down and Piers Davies um, from the University of Nottingham this evening. They're both doing PhDs surrounding the Dairy Co Mastitis Control Plan, so they'll be giving us their uh, updates on their PhDs. Um, if we do questions regarding each presentation at the end, Pete is going to go first. So if you do have any questions going through the presentation, please just type them down and we'll, we'll make a note of them and then we'll address them um, when Pete and Piers are finished. Um, as with all technology, there could well be some technical problems, but we will hope, but we will hope that we'll, uh, we'll keep things going. Can you all, I'll just write yes if you can hear me, please, in, the, um, in your little box. Great, great. We've got some yeses. That's a good start. Right, so we can't hear you at this end, but as I say, if you do have any questions, just type, it, uh, type them in those, uh, that box for us. That would be great. Right, so we'll get going. I'll pass over to Pete. Thank you very much. Okay, hello everyone. It's nice to join you this evening. I'm going to run through a bit of, um, a bit of my current work at the moment. So I'm going to start um, with my PhD project, the title of which is a Bayesian Decision Theoretic Framework to Evaluate and optimise decision making for mastitis control in the UK mastitis control scheme. So a bit of background about me. I qualified from Bristol Vet School back in 2004, worked in mixed practice for just over six years, and then I moved home back to Nottingham Vet School to embark on a farm animal residency there, and then I uh, embarked on this PhD project in February last year. for a moment to actually click and we'll get somewhere. So I'm going to um, start by giving you an overview of my current PhD project and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, another aspect of my PhD project which is a study I've just finished. So there's some, some new findings there that, that have just been accepted for publication so I'll share those with you which is uh, using a similar methodology to what I'll be using in the, the, the first bit of my PhD. So um, I'll move on and talk about that afterwards. So for those of you who are less familiar with the Dairy Co Mastitis Control Plan, it was um, really in response to the fact that mastitis in the UK is still too common. Um, there are some key individuals playing very important roles, but on the whole, nationally, progress has been very slow or non-existent. So the idea was uh, whether we can have a, a wide range and collaborative approach to mastitis control, um, utilizing the uh, evidence and, and the research that we already have. So um, it was devised by uh, a group of vets that are now all based at Nottingham, and um, it was trialled on on, uh, on 52 dairy, dairy herds back in the, which was published in 2007. It was found to be uh, very effective, on, particularly on those farms that were, were more compliant, and, and reductions in mastitis of 20 to 30 percent were seen in the in the better farms. And um, it was then launched nationally in 2009 um, by Dairy Co. And since then, we've had um, a lot of plant users trained now, over, well over 260. It's been implemented on over 1,000 dairy farms in the UK. And the prelim preliminary analysis from those herds, uh, again, would suggest that um, it's, it's continued to be very effective. We're seeing reductions in cell counts and clinical mastitis rates. And I think um, my supervisor, Professor Martin Green, uh, spoke about that for Dairy Co. a few months ago, which is on there. YouTube channel, so you should be able to find that there. So a quick run through the sort of data that I'm using for my studies. The, when you start a control plan, you typically start by trying to make a diagnosis of where new infections are coming from. So to do this, we would tend to utilize the herd data, um, so whatever software the, the farm is using to record their parameters. And from that, we would be looking at um, clinical mastitis incidence rates and also somatic cell count patterns. Once we've got that diagnosis, we'll, we'll tend to try and decide whether it's more, uh, when more infections are occurring sort of in the dry period, or in the lactating period, and whether the, it, it seems to be more of an environmental type pathogen or contagious. So we, there, there's a four potential diagnoses we can use there. And then we'd move on, we'd visit the farm, 
we would um, interview the farmer and, and go through it's quite a, a detailed questionnaire covering all aspects of management relevant to mastitis. And they, the answers for that, to that questionnaire would go into some special software called the ePlan software. And um, once we put in the diagnosis that you've also made, it would then highlight which, uh, which interventions would be most likely to be beneficial for, for that, given that sort of diagnosis. And then the, the plan user would try and highlight five to ten uh, action points from that and agree with the farmer which ones to, to implement. And then this cycle carries on every sort of six to 12 months or so. We review the data and, and, uh, and review what sort of interventions we ought to be implementing. And, and this is, I'm going to have access to all of this data, which I'm going to be um, utilizing. And the main aspect of, of my PhD is, is trying to really refine the decision-making process around which interventions uh, to, to prioritize for a specific farm. The difficulty we have with making these decisions is that all the farms we work on are going to have different patterns, uh, and different diagnoses made, there will be different sizes of herds with different epidemiology, different cell counts and clinical mastitis rates, uh, different parlor routines and, and, and ways of housing the cows and, and the management in general, and also different grazing policies. And it, it's a bit of a minefield, therefore, trying to decide which in interventions are going to be most effective on on specific farms, and this is the, the question that I'm trying to, to really uh, address with, with my PhD. So the plan of action, I'm going to begin with data collection, so this is the, the phase I'm still at really. I've got, I've got collected all the ePlan data and the farm data, and I'm now in the process of uh, gathering uh, which interventions were actually implemented on various farms, so for those plan users that are listening, um, be, be ready to hear from me in due course, and if you can respond as quickly as you can, that would be really appreciated. Um, once I've got all that data in, I'll do a bit of initial descriptive analysis, and then I'll move on to a multivariable data analysis. So this is effectively trying to look at um, what effect the different interventions have had on each of these individual farms that have implemented the plan. I'm then going to use that data to feed into what is called a probabilistic sensitivity analysis. Don't worry too much about that at the moment. I'll go into it in more detail in due course. Um, but it's basically going to allow me to um, synthesize the initial data with economic and production information. And then that from with that model, I can then predict consequences of different interventions in different farm circumstances. And also, importantly, um, calculate the, the likely associated costs. As part of my project, I'll also be working closely with Dairy Care, I'll be, um, which can involve lots of different facets from business management, knowledge transfer, and also I'm going to be um, involved with updating. Um, I'll go back, sorry, updating the ePlan software, um, which all the plan users have access to, and therefore the results from my probabilistic sensitivity analysis will be available to all the plan users, so that when they put in all the information rather than just highlighting 30 or 40 of the most relevant interventions, it will then be able to give you more detail on the, the, the likely probability of, um, of, a, of, a, of a positive cost benefit and, and, what, and, and, the, and the, um, the likely gains from those interventions. So it should have an immediate impact on, um, on how we uh, manage mastitis uh, with the control plan. So I'm now going to give you an example of, of this uh, probabilistic sensitivity analysis. This is a, a project that's going to form part of my PhD. I've just uh, finished this, and it's just been accepted for publication. It's looking at the, uh, the, the, what the factors that affect the cost of clinical mastitis, and uh, including a risk of transmission. So we know that there are lots of different figures banded around for uh, the cost of clinical mastitis. There are um, figures from sort of the low hundreds up to um, closer to sort of 400 pounds, and there's a lot of variation in between. And it's, it's hard to make sense of these average figures for, uh, for individual farmers. Uh, the reason for this variability is that there's lots of different factors that affect the cost of clinical mastitis. So some of the more obvious ones are sort of so, so, so-called direct costs, such as the cost of uh, drugs, the milk discard, and labor. And then there are the indirect costs, the more hidden ones, that are often more significant, such as uh, the loss in uh, 
future yield and production and, and increase in culling rates. And uh, all these figures are going to be different from farm to farm. And there's obviously all different uh, cow level variability as well in, in the severity of the case. Um, and the um, and how the cow reacts to that case. And one thing that's missing from all of these figures is transmission, and, and it's it's hard to know what uh, impact transmission might have on this overall cost. And there's lots of reasons why transmission has been absent from these calculations. The first one is that it's actually quite a difficult thing to uh, model and and um, and to actually investigate. We've only recently had the computational power really to, to um, do these, these sort of calculations quite recently, so um, there's not been a lot of this work previously. So there's very little quantitative data available to use at the moment. There's been very few studies that have actually looked at this and, and sought to quantify exactly how much transmission is occurring on farms. The studies that are available typically focus on subclinical mastitis rather than clinical. And as I said, it's very difficult to monitor this on farm day to day, so it's another reason why this sort of um, this data is, is not typically available. So the aim of this study was to try and evaluate the relative importance of different components of a model designed to estimate the cost of clinical, clinical mastitis. So those factors that I've previously outlined, we're trying to see um, how important they are relatively to the overall cost of a case of clinical mastitis. And included in this model is this um, risk of transmission between cows. And the particular aim was to then assess how important transmission was relative to those other factors that I've outlined, such as milk price and the cost of therapeutic agents. So the methods that I used, um, I used a stochastic Monte Carlo model. Now that probably means very little to a lot of you. The stochastic basically means it's a, a sort of sequence of random events, if you like. And the Monte Carlo bit basically it refers to a technique of, of simulation where I can I can simulate thousands of different cases of clinical mastitis, each with a different um, value for the various parameters in the model, which are selected at random by the, the computer. And this way, I can um, we, uh, I can simulate lots of different pot potential scenarios, which I can then investigate. I used uniform distributions throughout my model, so this means that. Um, I didn't make any real judgment as to which scenario was more or less likely than any others. I'm just trying to investigate a broad range of, of potential scenarios. And as I said, a risk of transmission parameter was also included. So probabilistic sensitivity analysis is a bit of a mouthful. I keep talking about it. So what is it? It's um, a technique that is widely adopted in the human healthcare sector for all cost effectiveness analysis. It's actually now uh, a requirement by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence for all um, economic studies relevant to human medicines, uh, but actually in, in the veterinary literature it's, it's almost absent completely. So it's something that, um, as I say, is, is, is widely adopted in the human sector, but we're, we're way behind still in the veterinary world, which we're seeking to address. Um, the key feature of it is that all the estimates of input parameters in the model are specified as full probability distributions, so this is a probabilistic uh, approach, rather than point estimates. So we, we're trying to represent all of that and capture that uncertainty that we have regarding these values from different farms, and that often we don't actually know what the, the true value is, but we've often got a good idea um, of what the sort of range of values we're getting, and then we can propagate that uncertainty all the way through the model um, so that that imprecision that we have is, is captured. So an example would be if we, um, if we take the uh, cure rate, uh, bacteriological cure rate of a case of clinical mastitis, we might not know exactly what that cure rate is going to be, and some studies would just take an average and say 60%, uh, but if we want to try and reflect the uncertainty, we might say, well, actually, the figure is going to be somewhere between 40% and 80%, so it might be 40% um, in the case of, a, let's say, a staph aureus, so quite a difficult pathogen to treat. And it might be much higher for an E. coli case, for example, it might be close to 80%. So um, rather than trying to stipulate one uh, value, we'd give a range, and then when the computer runs its analysis, it can then, uh, this is the sort of Monte Carlo bit, it would then take uh, a figure from within that range at each cycle of the model, and it would use that figure throughout the rest of the model. 
and then we can sort of capture those all that, that whole range of different values that we might see from farm to farm. So this is the structure of my model. I won't dwell on it too much because it's a bit um, it's a bit of a lot to take in. But effectively, if you start on the left hand side, that's the case of clinical mastitis. That's the index case. And then from there, there are different routes the cow can take. Okay, so right at the very top there is uh, the complete cure. So that means that the the, cat, the, the case is treated with antibiotics and uh, is completely cured bacteriologically and clinically. And then the cow carries on through the rest of lactation. It can either be called prematurely or end lactation. Right at the bottom there is the, the failure to cure, so that means that there's no response to, to therapy, and that cow would have a repeat of the initial course of antibiotics and carry on from there. And in the middle, we have the, those cows that seem to respond to medication, so the milk clears up and goes back in the tank, but the cow remains subclinically infected. And um, the important feature, really, of this model is that for all of those cows that, um, that remain subclinically infected, they, uh, a, they, a, they, they present a risk of transmission to other herd mates. So how did I model the transmission? Well, I used a uniform distribution. Again, that was uh, specified from a very low risk, 0.002, up to about a 1 in 4, so uh, 0.25 risk of transmission. And that's referring to the risk of one cow transmitting to another in a two-week period. Okay, and I um, modeled a, a, a period of uh, 12 weeks in total, and um, that was split into two-week intervals. The susceptible population was taken as 99 cows right at the start of the transmission period, and then this was reduced according to the number of cows that became infected after each two-week period. So um, if uh, two more cows were infected, they would then become, they would become unsusceptible for the next round, and all, but also they can then contribute potentially to further infection, and this is how, how that, the transmission side of it was, was modeled. For my analysis, I used a uh, Spearman rank correlation coefficient. So this is a, a, a way of exploring how closely related um, a parameter is to a variable is to the overall cost of clinical mastitis. And then I also used some linear regression models to, to then uh, do some predictive um, work. So trying to look at what effect uh, changes in those variables would have on the overall cost of clinical mastitis. So the overall purpose was really to enable exploration of the relationship between each model parameter and the overall cost benefit of each treatment protocol over a wide range of possible scenarios. And here are some results. So this is the, the, the Spearman rank uh, correlation coefficient. So you can see the bar on the far left there uh, relates to transmission. And you can see it's um, by far and away the most uh, closely related uh, parameter to the overall cost of clinical mastitis. And um, the, the next few most significant are bacteriological cure rate, cost of culling, and total yield loss, but, but some way behind um, the cost of uh, the, the uh, impact on, of transmission. So it's um, really quite a significant result there. Some scatter plots, uh, just again to demonstrate some of those patterns. So again, the top left, you can see a nice um, the positive um, relationship here between the risk of transmission and the overall cost of clinical mastitis. Um, the, the, the trend is less easy to, to appreciate with bacteriological cure rate and cost of cull, but you can still see an overall um, trend there as, sort of as, as the bacteriological cure rate increases, the cost decreases, as you would expect, and um, as the cost of culling increases, the so does the overall cost. Um, so there's some nice patterns to appreciate there, and it, and it, but as I say, none of them quite as, as um, well related there as, as the, the risk of transmission. This is a tornado plot, so this is reflecting the results from my regression analysis. Um, again, you can see that by doubling the rate of transmission from around a 1 in 8 risk to a 1 in 4, would result in a 60% increase in clinical mastitis, in the cost of clinical mastitis. So it's a, a huge effect 
uh, potentially this is having, and uh, far more important than things that often we may get more caught up in, such as the, the cost of drugs, for example, which barely feature. So just to conclude then from this study, the, the risk of transmission um, was very significant, had a very significant impact on the overall cost of clinical mastitis. The size of these, uh, of these words indicate how uh, important they were in my model. And um, there, therefore, we need to think about transmission, consider transmission when we're looking at ways of reducing the costs of clinical mastitis on dairy farms. Um, there's been a few studies looking at how, how we best do this. It's typically focused around the um, parlor routine and, and how we manage the cows around milking. So um, one that's always around is the, the wearing of gloves. And again, we know it's often poorly practiced on many dairy farms, and it's, it's something that's relatively simple and cheap and very effective. Also, the use of um, adequately, uh, appropriately set up automatic, cl automatic cluster removal uh, devices and for their clusters, and the use of post-milking peat disinfection, and another widely underutilized uh, control strategy is, is the grouping of infected cows, so trying to milk high somatic cell count and uh, clinically affected cows at the end of milking. Um, this has been shown to be very effective, I know practically it can be very difficult on some farms, but it's something that uh, is very effective if it's, if it's, if it's doable. Um, regular milking machine maintenance is another factor that, uh, as again, studies have shown to be actually poorly done in the UK, uh, and should be done at least annually. And in those cases where grouping of cows is, um, is very difficult, and there is a, a degree of contagious spread occurring, then um, a back flushing cluster system may be, may be a, a pragmatic response to that. However, the, some of the data is a bit sketchy for it, so it's, it's, uh, it's important that we ascertain uh, a place for it on a specific farm and that there is a, uh, an argument for it. So that's the end of my uh, presentation. I want to thank Dairy Co and VBSLC for the funding and uh, all my wonderful colleagues that I work with at Nottingham. And I'm now going to hand over to Piers. We talk about strep hubris. Brilliant. Thanks very much, um, Pete. Has anybody got any questions for Pete before we move on to Piers? You can sort of type in your little box. Okay. I suppose, I suppose the important thing to say, Pete, with that is that obviously those things have all been proven to work, but it is very important, isn't it, to make sure you find out what's happening on your specific farm yeah. rather than just guessing um, which is where the mosaic control fund comes in. Who just typed yes in that box? Do you have a question? <laughs> just hang on two minutes and give you a chance to type it. Right, we'll get we'll get going with them um, with Pete's presentation. And if you do have a question regarding Pete's um, presentation, we can all come back to that at the end. So I'll pass over to Pete. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> so the title of my PhD is development of a novel tool to predict and prevent strep hubris uh, mastitis in bush dairy herds. The uh, approach is a little bit different to uh, many of the other um, studies that have been carried out in the area. Uh, for some very many years, because we're really taking a multidisciplinary approach to the problem. So we're looking both at the molecular epidemiology of the, the pathogen, we're also looking at the cow and farm level factors um, that surround it, and by interrelating those with the strain level data, strain type data, we can then produce much more accurate multi-level models, so we can produce a, a predictive um, probability of the, uh, the risk of different types of, of mastitis transmission, especially in strep hubris. There you go. Um, the purpose of the tool is to provide something which is going to be additive to what the mastitis, the mastitis control plan already has. So 
a way of actual um, plan deliverers, vets and, uh, and extension officers, for example, to be able to take on-farm data and be able to integrate that into the control plan to provide a more focused list of uh, priorities for improvements um, in, in herds who are dealing with strep hubris problems. Our traditional classification of uh, mastitis pathogens has really focused on a contagious and environmental um, classification. The Streptococcus and E. coli very definitely put into the environmental camp, and uh, Agalacti, Discalacti, and, and uh, Staph aureus being put into the contagious camp. And we're appreciating more and more that this is actually quite an outdated, outmoded um, classification scheme, which doesn't really reflect the, the real biology that we're seeing on farm. What we're actually seeing is something much more like this. So it's a, more of a continuum with some species showing much more of a, an obligate, contagious transmission pattern, um, like Strep A. Uh, and others a much more obligate environmental pathogen, like E. coli, with Ubris and Staph aureus somewhere in the middle, with uh, several farms um, in literature already having been recorded with quite convincing, contagious transmission patterns for, for Strep Ubris. So why are we concentrating on strep hubris rather than any of the other pathogens? Well, I think it's worth remembering that strep hubris is by far the most important single major pathogen in the UK, so accounting between a quarter and a third of clinical cases and high cell count cases. We know that we have certain farms who are really struggling with strep hubris infections on farms which are not following the conventional traditional pattern. So these are, these are farms where they have recurrent strep hubris infections, so-called cow-adapted strep hubris infections, where the, the pathogen is being maintained within the other long term and is therefore acting as a, 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 a persistent infection which is then um, potentially available for transmission from cow to cow, primarily through the parlour and through the milking regime, rather than requiring an environmental point source uh, to act as a, as a source of infection. So if we can predict um, it early on in the course of a strep hubris outbreak how the pathogen is being transmitted, then we can give the farmer a much more focused, much more tailored set of recommendations rather than giving him 10 or 20 or 30 recommendations, all of which may play a part depending on how the buggy is being transmitted. We can hone that down to a handful and greatly increase the likelihood of them actually being able to make, a, uh, make the right interventions in the most appropriate time. The resources we have to work with are primarily the, uh, the original 52 farms from the, uh, the, the control and test uh, mastitis uh, control plan back in 2004-2006. So that represents 8,500 cows where every single clinical case in every cow during that one year period for each of those farms was, uh, was catalogued and, uh, and, and it's available for us to carry out further testing. So that represents over 1,100 strep hubris clinical cases uh, and a huge library of both farm and cow level data, automatic cell count data, the management data, the management practice data, the, uh, the parlor hygiene protocols, for example, calving dates, drying off dates. And all this can then be integrated into, into our predictive tool. The methods we're using um, are principally in, in three components. So first of all, we're using a strain typing technique called multilocus sequence typing, or MLST. And we're also using, to complement this, a mass spectrometry technique, which looks at the proteins produced by each of the different um, isolates of strep hubris. And the protein spectrums produced um, would strongly suggest that there's a difference between strains. We're then using the information produced by the, the first two techniques, along with the, uh, the, the epidemiological data and the survey data collected um, alongside the original samples, to put that into a statistical model, um, which is taking the form of a, of a multi-level model, uh, which will build over the next couple of years, which will then produce the final, the final output. So just to give you a very brief um, description of the different techniques, um, MLST is a fantastically powerful technique used a great deal in molecular epidemiology across uh, all species. Uh, it's been used 
in, in the last 10 years in strep hubris cases on individual farms in different parts of the world. And this has really been the, the means where we've been able to identify um, the strong indicators of contagious transmission of strep hubris. What it involves doing is, rather than taking a, a sequencing of the entire genome of bacteria, we just look at the elements which are the most slowly evolving. So these are the so-called housekeeping genes. These are seven genes, in the case of strep hubris, which evolve at the slowest rate because they are, their, their function is a, a so-called conserved function, and which is essential for the, the cell's, um, the cell's uh, existence. So they will adapt and mutate at a relatively slow rate so we can track the, the distance, the sort of relation distance between different strains. We can then plot these onto a dense diagram, um, which rather than giving us an exact family tree, will give us a, a grouping of, uh, of different strains. Streptococcus is a particularly difficult bacteria to, to deal with because rather than just having a uh, sort of a linear mutation uh, evolution, it also recombines, swapping large chunks of, of genetic material between, uh, between bacteria and potentially between strains as well, which can muddy the waters very, very easily. And it, for, partly for this reason, and also for um, uh, pragmatic and, and potentially uh, long-term commercial reasons, we're also looking at protein mass spectrometry, or MOLDITOF, um, which is a, a technique where we actually take a whole culture of growing bacteria from an isolate, and we subject it to a laser which vaporizes the, the proteins produced by the, uh, by the, the bacteria in, in, their, in their replication, and then accelerates them across the vacuum, and then the, the rates at which they, they reach the receiver plate at the other end gives you a fingerprint, effectively, for each different bacteria. Now, the advantage of this technique over the, the genomic technique of, of MLST is that this gives you a means of seeing actually what the bacteria are producing. And it's these proteins which in the end relate to the actual virulence, the actual pathogenicity of the bacteria. Whereas with the, with the genomics, you can have a lot of redundant genes, potentially, where you can have, um, you can have strains with exactly um, the same housekeeping genes, but actually able to do very different, um, very different uh, uh, transmission routes uh, by virtue of recombination. If there is a, a real difference in uh, in their pathogenicity, we should hopefully be able to find it with the mass spectrometry. Long term, the mass spectrometry also gives us the potential that um, we can roll this out uh, through commercial labs such as NMR or QMS, and um, in the future to be able to provide on farm a way of strain typing very very quickly. The uh, the causative uh, type of strep hubris, and this then can be added in to the information the farmer has in terms of cell, somatic cell count data, for example, to improve the accuracy of the of the output of the predictive tool for each individual farm. Compared to MLST, Molbutov is much much quicker, so you can get a turnaround time of uh, 24 hours rather than with the uh, with the MLST uh, being many many days. If So um, these techniques are, are very complementary, and uh, the, the combination of the two should hopefully give us a really good, powerful output. Um, and they give us an opportunity as well to cross-check to see whether the, the groupings produced by the genomics and the groupings produced by the, the, the protonomics uh, actually overlap, or whether there are, there are elements we then need to go into in more detail. We may also, with a combination of these techniques, be able to identify potential isolates then look at in more detail um, for virulence targets, for example, and potentially in the future for vaccine targets. The final part is then actually to model this data. And there we need to take this strain data and we need to then integrate it with farm level data, particularly things like um, housing management, calving periods, uh, parlor management, parlor routine, parlor hygiene, along with also the individual cow level factors. So, are the things which are making the animals most susceptible, things like their individual somatic cell counts, the somatic cell counts running up to the, 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 the clinical case, can we use these to predict what the, uh, what the, uh, the likelihood of animals 
uh, being susceptible to a contagious type strain or environmental type strain are. And these, this is going to be work which we're going to be doing more and more over the next two years and uh, will hopefully be, be really productive. So just to give you a flavor of the results that we have so far, we're still at a very early stage, but we have uh, almost 500 uh, isolates uh, back now from the uh, from total of, of over 1,100. So we already have some very interesting groupings of potential candidates who look like they are ca capable of being cow adapted and, uh, and uh, being contagious, both present on, on uh, individual farms and between farms as well. We've also found uh, several new alleles, so several new forms of these genes, um, and, uh, and dozens of new strains which hadn't been previously identified. So to give you an idea of what, uh, of what your typical farm would look like, this is a very nice example of, a, uh, of an environmental farm. So in the center column in green, the, the numbers there refer to strain type designations. And as you see on this farm, uh, there's a whole range of different strain types there causing clinical cases. In, uh, in the, the individual cows, and um, no predominant strain there, so indicating this is more likely to be an environmental uh, type source of infection or transmission. Compared to that, this is uh, a set of data which is still uh, in the process of being, of being finalized. We're still trying to elucidate some of the alleles, but it shows a really nice example where we have four different cows, highlighted in red on the left-hand side, which have the same strain type. Uh, so in this herd, there's a, a small number of strain types which are, are causing all of the strep uberus cases. When we have all the data back, we'll be able to get a clearer picture. But this is a, an interesting example where we potentially have a lot of contagious spread between cows uh, with only a, a very small number of strain types rather than an environmental type, uh, type spread. We can also see that these, these uh, cases are clustered in time as well. So by mapping how these cases occur and whether strains uh, of, of one type or another in cows of different types occur at different frequencies, it gives a lot, a lot of uh, information in terms of the, the dynamics of these strep humus outbreaks. And at an early stage then, how we can predict, how accurately we can predict what the, uh, the transmission rate or the transmission uh, source is. The, applica the applications of these are really uh, in allowing us to improve, as I was saying earlier, the, our, um, our ability to hone down on the most appropriate uh, interventions by giving the farmer a probability-based uh, predictive tool rather than just a best guess uh, set of recommendations. And then hopefully with the, the protonomics, particularly with the Molotov, providing a quick and cheap means of identifying streptiver strains at the subspecies level, which can potentially give us a much greater um, uh, level of in information uh, in real time as to what the, uh, the situation of the individual farms are. Uh, and then in the slightly longer term, this project gives us the opportunity to identify phenotypes with particular, particular virulence, gives us a, a means of identifying candidates for much greater investigations and potential, potential vaccine uh, targets as well, uh, first of all by doing a full genome sequence and, and then more targeted uh, examinations of, uh, of what these genomic differences uh, confer in terms of their ability to, uh, to spread on farm. So potentially there's a, a, a lot of exciting work which, which can be done in this area as well. So I'd like to thank my supervisors uh, and Federico for funding the project and, and, uh, and the long list of uh, other research collaborators in other institutions who have, uh, who have helped at various stages and are going to help further in the future. And, uh, that's uh, all for me. <coughs> Thanks very much, Piers. Um, OK, if anybody's got any questions for Piers, will you just type in the box? I think we've probably got one relating back to Pete, actually. So we'll just go back to that. If you guys want to type all your questions in, and then we'll uh, try and address the one that we've got. If we just Can you read that out, Laura? Laura, I can't read that from here.
Okay, this is somebody asking about transmission. So when using a dump bucket, um, what would you recommend as a suitable post cluster clean? Um, they're currently using post dip with hydrochloride um, and water in the dump bucket clusters. Um, before moving on to the next cloud, um they're not using a back flush system. Okay, yeah, so um, this is a, a kind of area that there's not really any real research to help with this one. They're using the, say, dilute hydrochloride, and a rinse out would be, you know, would be a reasonable thing to do. I'd have thought uh, you've got to be careful when you're just uh, plunging clusters into that solution. You get this sort of bell effect. You get air trapped at the top of the clusters, and therefore it doesn't actually clean very thoroughly. So it's important that when you are using any of these uh, solutions to try and really ensure that uh, there's plenty of it gets up into the cluster and they do get a really good clean. Um, it's, uh, but as I say, I can't really, I, I'm not, I wouldn't really go into recommending specific solutions for that because there's not a great deal of, of science behind any of it, to be honest. Um, the, the best way is obviously to, uh, to keep cows, uh, to milk the in, infected cows uh, infected cows at the end, uh, and then there's less worries of it being spread, whatever system you use to, to the next one. But um, yeah, I, I can't really comment any more on that, really. OK, we've had another question um, asking if different strains of hubris respond differently to treatment. Uh, the short answer to that is yes, very, very definitely. And um, we've got good cases, got good case evidence that uh, the more the more uh, difficult to treat strep hubris cases, which come back and recur, um, are be able to behave in quite a different way um, to uh, to your conventional majority hubrises, uh, which generally respond very quickly to treatment. And there's some evidence that this has uh, quite a profound sort of biological basis, where there's been able to find strep hubris bacteria, which are able to hide within the cells, within the epithelial cells of the other, so are able to then evade treatment. Um, where, especially when they're given um, as uh, normal courses of intramammary tubes. So we don't know exactly which strains are able to survive um, in, in which ways, but we certainly have good, uh, a good idea that they do indeed behave differently. 